morning and welcome. You'll need your hymn books this morning. You don't have the screen. So let's begin our worship service with hymn 546. 546. Love lifted me. Let's all stand. to the house of the Lord. Uh, it's good to see our attendance numbers back up a little bit as we're kind of weathering this little spike in COVID. I uh, hope you guys will continue to pray for those that are in recovery. It's good to see some back, but uh, we need to continue to pray that uh, it wouldn't get a, any more than what we have and we could get back to normal. A couple of announcements here. Prayer meeting this Wednesday night will once again be on the telephone. So if you call in that number, 617-829- 6585. We'll gather together there, share some prayer requests, and we're just going to kind of play it by ear. We're going to try one more Wednesday on the phone, and then we'll see if we can actually start meeting in person after that. It's all going to depend on uh, how our uh, attendance numbers look, okay? And uh, also, fifth Sunday lunch, there's a sign-up sheet out in the vestibule. I want to encourage you to sign up for that. I'm sure it's going to be delicious spaghetti and salad, and uh, asking the ladies to bring a dessert. So, let us know that you're going to be here. Uh, Melissa has pretty much got just one ticket left, I think, uh, She uh, uh, for the show. She told me that. She said, if necessary, we'll purchase some more, but this will be the uh, show in December, uh, December 1st at the Rudy Theater in Selma, and so see her about that. And then, so far, the Powell Family Concert is on for November 6th. We're going to kind of wait one more Sunday and see how things go. Uh, before we make a decision as to whether we continue or whether we postpone, but uh, we want to make sure that we have a good crowd for them as they come to minister in song, okay? Um, personal announcement, I want to encourage you today. I am scheduled to be in Cartagena, Colombia, December 10th through the 17th on a mission trip. That's South America. And uh, so we'll be down there training pastors and lay people in evangelism. And so I would love to have you guys pray for me 
Uh, I have a little bookmark here that has the uh, date as a reminder to pray. Brother Marty Dupree, who's here with us this morning, has already agreed to come fill in, so I know you guys are going to be blessed. But I want to encourage you, if you would like one of these, uh, I'll have those back as we are dismissing today that you can grab one. And then you'll notice on the back there's another opportunity that's coming up next February to do an outreach at the Super Bowl. So there's two different events that I would encourage your prayers for. I would thank you for that in advance. So see me afterwards to get one of those, okay? Anything that needs to be announced that's not in our bulletin today? Brother Mike? I would say it's wonderful to see these young families out in the gym. Amen, amen, praise the Lord. Yes, indeed, we're thankful for that. All right, well, let's go to God in prayer. Our gracious God, we're so thankful for this opportunity we have to gather as your people here in worship. Lord, to hear from you through your word and to minister to you in song as we sing our hymns, as we come and bring our worship. Lord, we thank you so much that you have made a way for us to do that through Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you for those who are on the men from the COVID. I pray, God, that you will just continue to bless them. I know we have a number of people that are out in the parking lot today as well. I want to thank you for them being here today. And Father, I just want to pray that we would get past this little bump in the road and that we would be able to continue on full steam ahead pursuing you. And Lord, we're just going to thank you so much in advance for all that you're going to do in the service today and in our days ahead. And we pray all this in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Larry. Let's all stand as we continue our worship service with hymn 138. 138 at Calvary.
Children's Church. I remember this week. How about that? There's not, huh? <laughs> Y'all have fun now. Not too much fun. Alrighty. If you would take your Bibles and go with me to Nehemiah chapter four. Nehemiah chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at that entire chapter. It's not a long chapter, so it'll only take a few minutes for us to read. The message this morning is entitled, Sticks and Stones. And you might be familiar with that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie from the devil, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Yes, indeed. So, Nehemiah chapter 4. Give you a moment to get there. And if you are able, please stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Now when Sanballat heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him, and he said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that they were repairing the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At the time, the Jews who lived near there, them came from all directions and said to us ten times, You must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember, the Lord who is great and awesome uh, will fight for your brothers and your sons, your daughters, and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known among us that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail, and the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders said his sword strapped to his side. Uh, I'm sorry. Each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side when he built, built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be guard for us by night and may be labor by day. 
So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our weapons. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity again to come and continue on in our study of the book of Nehemiah. Lord, we see how this work was being opposed by a handful of troublemakers here, Lord. And Father, we see how Nehemiah and the people responded to that. Nehemiah continued to pray. Nehemiah continued to uh, follow the plan that you had given him. And he continued to hope and trust in you. Oh Lord, I thank you that we can hope and trust in you, believing that you have a plan for your people. You have a plan for your church. You have called them to a work. And God, no matter what the enemy tries to throw at your people, we can trust in you. And we can praise you and thank you in advance because we know you're going to hear and answer our prayer. Father, I pray that as we look at this passage today, you'll speak to each and every heart. And Lord, I pray most of all that I would decrease so that Jesus Christ would increase. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In 1928, the undefeated Army football team stepped onto the field at Yankee Stadium to face Notre Dame. Notre Dame was experiencing the worst season on record under the leadership of legendary coach Newt Rockney. At halftime, it looked as if Army had the game under their control. So, as the beleaguered players sat in the locker room, Rockney knew what he had to do. Rockney proceeded to share with them the last words of George Gipp, one of the greatest players to ever play for Notre Dame. Gipp died of strep infection while he was under Rockney's leadership. So Rockney shared Gipp's final words with them. And it went something like this. Sometimes when the team is up against it and the brakes are beating the boys, tell them to go out there with all they got and win just one for the Gipper. You might be familiar with that quote. Notre Dame went on to beat Army 12 to 6. Well, folks, Nehemiah chapter 4 is basically half time. And it looks like that the team is down. It looks like that they are facing defeat in the face of this opposition. The opposing team, Sanballat and Tobiah, had turned things up a notch. And it looked as if the work would once again come to a standstill. And so what's going to happen next is going to be critical to the outcome. They were at the point where it was either win or lose, do or die, put up or shut up. And so Nehemiah went to encourage them in the work. Think about this for just a minute. Momentum or motion causes friction. And so here we see God's people making motion going forward with the rebuilding of the wall and we also see this counter opposition. We see this counter motion of Sanballat and Tobiah. And they are there trying to discourage, trying to stop the work. And so we can expect if we follow God's will, if we follow the vision that he has for us as a church, that we will encounter opposition. We will encounter spiritual warfare. And so we must be ready for that. We must be prepared for that. I want us to look at this this morning and talk about it. First of all, I want us to talk about the stages of opposition because we see several stages that this opposition went through here. Now, first of all, let's talk about the cause of opposition. When it comes to God's vision, there are some causes, I believe, are, that are pretty common when it comes to the church and God's vision. First of all, discomfort with change. People get uncomfortable when you start mentioning change. It's been said that the only one who likes change is a baby with a dirty diaper. <laughs> By the way, do you know how many Baptists it takes to change a light bulb? Change? What do you mean change? Okay. So we see some discomfort here with change. Sometimes implementing a renewed vision from God requires a change in way churches do things. Now, let me just stop right here and, and mention this. You don't change the message. 
The message is the same. The message is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and rose for sins so that we could be forgiven. But sometimes the method in which you deliver that message needs to change. And so we need to be mindful of that. If anything, we have learned in the past two and a half years from COVID, we need to understand that we cannot be comfortable in the way we do things because life is uncertain and change and challenge comes whether we're ready for it or not. Sanballat, Tobiah, and the enemies of the people, they had grown used to a weakened people. They had grown used to a weakened Jerusalem and, Jerusalem and Judah. So once the wall was going to be rebuilt, they knew that their time was going to be short. And so oftentimes, discomfort with change brings opposition. Also, feelings of power being lost can bring opposition. Sometimes change makes people feel like they're no longer in control. And when it comes to church, we must realize, first of all, that Jesus is the one in control. Amen? Amen. He's the one in charge. He is the shepherd, and, and we are the flock. <clears throat> Sometimes it makes people feel uncomfortable, though. And I think this happens a lot in churches. Uh, I know sometimes churches say they want to grow, and I truly believe they're genuine in that, but then when new people start coming in, when younger people start coming in, sometimes that causes problems, that causes opposition. And it's because we feel uncomfortable. We feel upset that the new people are going to come in and they're going to kind of take over. Folks, resentment is a powerful emotion. Sanballat and Tobiah knew that the control they had exercised over the Jewish people was slipping away. And so they had this feeling that their power was being lost. Maybe it's just utter rebellion. It should have been abundantly clear to Sanballat and Tobiah that God was at work in the situation because they heard Nehemiah give the very same testimony that he gave to the Jewish people, how God's hand was upon him and how God had provided for this renewed wall to be built. And so they should have understood that. They should have submitted to the will of God, but they didn't. They rebelled against the will of God. Can church folks rebel against the will and vision of God? Absolutely, they can. Are there consequences for that? Oh, yeah. Nehemiah warned Sanballat and Tobiah that they had no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. And so they were simply rebelling against what God was doing. That's not a position you want to be in, folks. Rebelling against the word and the will of God. And then spiritual warfare. All of these things can be attributed to spiritual warfare. And I think we need to understand that. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so there is a spiritual battle that is going around us all the time. And we may not be aware of it, we may not see it, but it's there. Because the forces of darkness are there opposing the gospel. And so sometimes it's pure spiritual warfare that brings opposition. I mentioned this last week, and I think it bears repeating. Whenever God wants to build something up, Satan is going to try to tear it down. And so we've got to be aware of his scheme. Uh, if the church catches a fresh vision for revitalization, our adversary is going to seek to squash that enthusiasm. I want to share a quote with you by Andy Davis, who is the pastor of First Baptist Durham. And Andy Davis uh, led that church in a process of revitalization. And he wrote a book about it called Revitalize. He said, The most powerful weapon in the hands of our Almighty Lord for the destruction of Satan's dark kingdom is a healthy local church. He says, no one knows this better than Satan, and therefore it is expected that he will vigorously be vigorously active in fighting reform efforts made in specific local churches. And so Andy went through all of that. In his book, he details the process, but he recognizes the fact 
that Satan is there to oppose any work of revitalization that is undertaken on behalf of the church. And so these are the different causes. Now let's look at some of the stages of opposition. The first stage is this, contempt. Contempt. So going all the way back to chapter 2, we saw that in the second message that I preached where Sanballat, or the third message rather, whether, where Sanballat and Tobiah made it very clear that they were unhappy with what Nehemiah had come to do. Chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And then going down to verse number 19, we see where it says, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshub the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And so it began with this contempt for Nehemiah and this contempt for what God was doing there uh, with the renewed rebuilding of the wall. They didn't like what he represented. And so therefore they sought to stop him. The second stage is this, complaining. And so we saw this in the very opening of chapter 4, the complaints that they had. And let's just go back over that again. So when Sanballat heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? And then we see how Tobiah chimes in. And he gets a little bit more sarcastic here. He says, the wall that they're building, if a fox goes up on that wall, it's going to knock it down. It's going to break the wall. And so they were complaining, but at the same time, they were attempting to demoralize the folks that were working on the wall. Here's a principle that you can take to the bank, folks. Critics demoralize leaders encourage and so Nehemiah was a leader and he encouraged the people their criticism was meant to disrupt and discourage the work these people though had no authority to actually stop Nehemiah and what the Jewish people were doing and so complaining is the second stage the third stage is this conspiring so here we see in verses 7 and 8 when they come to the realization that their criticism wasn't working, then they began plotting. Then they began conspiring together to possibly execute an attack on the people while they were there working. And so they were, they were coming together. And notice also the size of the group had increased by this time. They had recruited more people to be on their side. So Sanballat hoped that the threat of an attack would be cause enough to cause the work to stop, cause the people to give up. But Nehemiah encouraged the people to carry on. And then finally we see the next stage, which is collaborating, working together. We're jumping over to Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 9 here. So I want to read that with you today because we're going to see how Nehemiah and his people were plotting to not just attack the people, but now they're plotting to take Nehemiah, the leader, out. So beginning in verse 1, says, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together at Hakuprim in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way and I answered in the very same manner. And so they had conspired together to try to take Nehemiah out himself, take him out personally. But what did Nehemiah say? I'm doing great work. 
I, I don't have time to come down. Because he knew, he understood that they were there trying to take him out. And so collaborating is that next stage. I'm thankful that Nehemiah had enough discernment not to fall for that. So we saw about the opposition here. Now we're going to see about the strain of the opposition because what they were doing did have some effect on the people. Verse 10, we read that again. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And so at this point, because of the criticism and because of the opposition, the building had become a burden. They said, it's too much. We can't do this. We're ready to give up. We're ready to throw in the towel. And so they were discouraged enough to want to quit. Suddenly, this whole task had become overwhelming, and they began to question whether they were able to do the job. This is a principle that is true in every area of life. If you think you can't do something, you won't. That's right. If you think you can't do something, you won't. So don't have that attitude. This becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they began to be discouraged. But you know, Nehemiah didn't give up. We see here what it says in Proverbs 23, verse 7. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And so if you get this attitude of discouragement and defeat, then guess what? You're going to be defeated already. And this, the enemy would have us to do that. I think discouragement is probably the number one tool that the enemy uses against us to get us discouraged. You've been discouraged before? I have, certainly have. And so the enemy is using that against them. Building had become a burden. And then in verse 11, we see where their faith began to falter. They said, and our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. Notice that phrase, and our enemies said, they began to listen to the lies of the enemy rather than to look to the promise of the Heavenly Father. Now, folks, in our Christian walk, we can do that. We can begin to listen to the enemy's lies and forget about the promises that God has given. The promise that God has given to his church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you listen to the enemy's voice, guess what? Your faith is going to falter. Their faith in the plan was beginning to crumble. But you know, again, Nehemiah didn't give up. And then we see in verse 12, retreat instead of resolve. Verse 12 says this, And at that time the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, You must return to us. In other words, what they're saying here is this, you guys better come home. You better, better go to your safe space because this enemy is coming against us and you're going to die. You're going to lose in this attack. So instead of being resolved, they began to retreat. Some began to panic. Some began to uh, want to give up. But look, Nehemiah had a plan. It says, In the lowest parts of the space between the wall and open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And so he put people in place to be on the lookout for this warfare that was coming. And folks, that's why I think it's so important for us to be involved in prayer because through prayer we are prepared for the warfare that the enemy will throw at us. So I'm thankful that God has allowed us to begin having the prayer meetings again, even if it's just over the phone, because I think it's crucial. And then we see this. We see the stand against opposition. There are four things that happen here in these verses. They prayed up, they perked up, they pressed on, and they prepared for the next battle. Amen. First of all, praying up. 
Notice how many times Nehemiah resorted to prayer when all this was going on. Notice how many times he went to his knees because he understood that it was a spiritual battle. And he understood the principle that the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Your prayers are powerful, saints. Your prayers are so powerful. I think the enemy trembles when we pray. Amen. When we get together as a church and pray. Nehemiah prayed up. And we need to pray up. And then they perked up. Look at what it says here in verse 14. It says, I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. He's saying, look to Jesus. Look to the Lord. Get ready to perk up and look to him because he is great and mighty and awesome. And he has prepared a plan. And then he encouraged them to press on. And so we see in verse 15, it says, When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. This was just a temporary setback. This was just a, a bump in the road, a speed bump, so to speak. They immediately went back to doing what they knew God had called them to do. My friends, along the way, as we seek God's vision for the church, there might be some speed bumps. There might be some setbacks. But we've got to press on. We've got to carry on for the Lord. And we must prepare for the next battle. So in verses 16 through 23, I'm not going to read those again, but we see how Nehemiah put a plan in place where there were people to guard those that were working and how those who were working worked with one hand and they had their hand on their weapon on the other side. They were ready. They were prepared. We've got to be ready and prepared for the battle that lies ahead. I want to close with this little illustration here. Everyone knows that a dog is man's best friend, right? So you know you're having a bad day when you get shot in the back by your own dog. Now this is a true story that happened in the fall of 2011. A 46-year-old man was out with his dog duck hunting. And so he had been drifting down a creek in a canoe and the man pulled up onto the bank of the marsh to put some decoys out. And when he did, he left his 12-gauge shotgun resting against the bow of the boat. And so apparently the dog decided to get a little excited and he jumped and did something to cause the gun to discharge and he hit his owner in the buttocks with some bird shot. <laughs> 27 pellets. P police consider it to be an accident and there were no charges that were filed but the dog remained silent about the incident. <laughs> Now, I know this is funny, okay, but it is a true story, and it communicates a powerful truth. Whenever it comes to implementing God's vision, sometimes the people that you thought were on your team are the ones that will shoot you in the back. You must be prepared to respond to them with grace and love. And the only way that you can do that is to pray up, to perk up, to press on, and then prepare for the battle. As I mentioned in my introduction, motion causes friction. And if you're not experiencing some friction while implementing God's vision, then maybe you're not actually implementing God's vision. Because it's so easy to implement our own vision and then ask God to bless it versus seeking Him and the vision that He's already given that's already blessed. So spiritual warfare is a reality when God's church seeks a new vision. We've got to be ready. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this day, and we're thankful for the great love and the mercy that you show us each and every day. And Lord, we thank you for the example here of Nehemiah and how he didn't give up. He looked to you. He knew the plan, 
And God, because of that, he was able to lead the people to continue on in the work. He was able to lead the people in the face of opposition. God, strengthen your church. Enable your people to carry on despite what might be thrown at them by the enemy. Lord, we know that the enemy would destroy any of the work of the kingdom if he could. But Lord, we also know that you are far more powerful than he ever will be. Lord, and we know that he is a defeated foe. We know that at the cross, his head was crushed because it says so in scripture. And so, Lord, we, we trust and believe that you're going to guide and direct your people, guide and direct your church into the work that you have called them to do. I pray, Lord, during this time of invitation that you would move among the hearts of your people and that your will would be done, God. We're so grateful and we're so thankful for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, my friends. Well, we have a time of invitation now. If the Lord has spoke to your heart about any decision that you feel like you need to make, I'll be down in front to receive you in that decision. But if God has spoke to your heart, Respond to him, not to me. The altar is open as well, but let's respond to what God is doing. Let's stand. Brother Larry. 329 and 329. Folks, I want to introduce to you today Jeff and Jennifer Moore. Moore, right? Morris. Morris. Morris sorry. And uh, I'm still learning names around here, so please <laughs> forgive me. But uh, they are coming forward this morning with a desire to unite with our church and fellowship. And so I'm thankful that the Lord has spoke to their hearts to be a part of his plan. And so I want to make a motion that they be received into our fellowship. Is there a second? Absolutely. All God's people said, Amen. 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 So, guys, we're so glad you're here. I want you to come by and say hi to them and uh, th uh, thank them for being a part of what God's doing. And they'll be down front here with Miss Patsy. So, okay, guys, God bless you. Thank you. I won't kick that over again. Yeah, probably. it's okay. <laughs> you did a great catch. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here today. And I want you to continue to pray for our folks that are out and pray that God will help them to recover and be back on the battlefield. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we're so